we see that people who drink more coffee um, have a have a have a degree of protection against Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, and also cardiovascular disease. So this new study gives us a potential mechanism, right? Um, which I think is which I think is so powerful. Max, welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Great to see you again, my friend. Great to see you. This is becoming a regular occurrence. I'm very, very excited about it. So speaking of regular occurrence, this is your third book. And tell us how to eat like a genius. What the heck are genius foods? That's a great that's a great starting point. So genius foods are foods that are going to give your brain the biggest the, the most bang for the buck in terms of shielding it against cognitive decline, helping it work better in the here and now with regard to your executive function, with regard to your brain's processing speed, and also with regard to your mental health, which is a function of good brain health. And I got into this when a couple of years ago my mother showed initial signs of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a rare form of dementia called Lewy body dementia, which is akin to having both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time. I didn't have a medical background, but I was a journalist. And at that point, I became solely focused on investigating why this would have happened to a woman at the age it did. My mom was 58. She was very young when she first started to show these symptoms. And what I've learned is that Dementia often, like many chronic non-communicable conditions, begins decades before the presentation of, of said symptoms. By the time you show up to your neurologist, for example, with Parkinson's disease, which is a very common movement disorder, half of the neurons in the substantia nigra, the dopamine producing neurons involved in movement in the region of the brain affected by Parkinson's disease have already perished. Alzheimer's disease is another example. Research shows that by the third decade of life, people who are genetically at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease already have begun to show signs in the brain that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So for me, I became very passionate about the notion of prevention, dementia prevention. Um, and I, I just went down the rabbit hole to learn everything that I possibly could about the condition. And as I would, the, the more I would read certain foods started to stand out to me. Foods that were, that are, for example, staples in the Mediterranean dietary pattern, like extra virgin olive oil, like dark leafy greens, like grass fed beef, um, like wild fatty fish. And I started to see that, um, people who eat these foods more regularly on a, on a consistent basis, whether or not you have a genetic predisposition to developing Alzheimer's disease, you can actually protect yourself by eating these foods on a regular basis. I was also really inspired when writing Genius Foods, which was my first book, by a study from Tufts University that found that people who adhere to the advice that you often hear echoed by the nutritional orthodoxy to just eat all things in moderation, that people who do that actually tend to have worse diets and poorer health outcomes. They tend to eat more, they tend to drink more sugar sweetened beverages, they tend to eat more confectionery products, more candies and things like that. The healthiest people buy a narrower range of more healthful foods and they just, they just buy those foods on loop. So with Genius Foods, I tried to come up with the ultimate brain health shopping list, if you will. And in my new book, Genius Kitchen, we're really it's where the, the, new, the new book is really where the rubber meets the road. It's taking those foods and it's turning them into delicious dishes that are easy to prepare using ingredients that are easy to find, low cost. And eating these kinds of foods, these dishes on a regular basis, according to the best available evidence, really are poised to give your brain the best shot, the best possible shot um, with regard to your diet um, in terms of helping minimize your risk for cognitive decline, uh, dementia and other age-related um, neurologic conditions. Yeah, you make uh, several really good points. Uh, I was uh, lecturing at, at Harvard Medical School uh, a few years ago uh, when, the, when the plant paradox came out, and it was to a bunch of neurologists. And you know, I made my pitch that there are certain foods that we should be eating and certain foods we shouldn't be eating. And, and one guy said, uh, stood up, and he says, well, you know, don't you think that 
the advice to eat in moderation is the best advice. And I said, yeah, that's great advice if you want moderate dementia and moderate heart disease and moderate arthritis. And I think you're echoing the same thing. Uh, this, this idea that eating in moderation is somehow uh, a, an escape clause to eat you know, junk every now and then is, is just not true. All things in moderation, right? I, I even think that, um, I mean, there's, we could look at uh, uh, something like red wine, right? Which is consistently associated with, with better health, right? Like, like moderate drinking is associated with better, better health. But you can't really drive around the fact that ethanol, which is the, the component of alcohol that gives you the buzz, is a neurotoxin, right? Correct. It's, it's a neurotoxin. It's carcinogenic. So I think that the reason why moderate drinkers are you know, typically have better health is not necessarily because of the alcohol. It's in spite of the alcohol. But what it does show is that 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 people who are able to drink moderately are able to be moderate. And that's something that that I think is is probably a good quality. It's it's somebody who's a moderate person is not perhaps a, a, a big risk taker. And so that's why, you know, it's called the healthy user bias. But um, but with regard to brain health and food, 90% of what we know about Alzheimer's disease, which is just the most common form of dementia, but it's not the only form of dementia, has been discovered in the past 15 years alone. So this is a rapidly evolving field of science. And the brain for a long time was thought to sit in isolation from the rest of the body. And medical doctors, Dr. Gundry, as you know, are, are not trained when it comes to nutrition in general. So you take a neurologist True. who who focuses on the brain and... Um, it was, it wasn't until very recently that we could even have a conversation about brain health and diet. And, and now we can, which is, which is so amazing. And I think it really, what, what's so important about it is that it gives us agency for this category of conditions for which there really are no meaningful treatments. I mean, I saw this firsthand with my mom, the drugs that are typically prescribed to treat conditions like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, they're biochemical band-aids. They're minimally effective at best, particularly at best. with at best with regard to the to, to the rare forms of dementias. And it's why there's this sort of cold joke that um, I discovered is 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 circulated amongst neurology residents in med school that neurologists don't treat disease; they admire it. And that, to me, as the uh, son of somebody who had dementia for many years and, and really suffered with it. Um, that just wasn't good enough. And so I've dedicated my life at this point to uh, trying to understand everything there is to know about, the, the, about diet, lifestyle, how it relates to brain health, and to spread that message to people of all ages. So uh, as, as you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the APOE4 mutation, sometimes called the Alzheimer's gene. And, you know, 30% of people actually carry the, that either one or two mutations. Um, hope, luckily, most people carry one of the mutations. But a lot of people go, well, you know, number one, I don't want to know if I carry that mutation uh, because there's nothing I can do about it. And number two, well, now that I know I have that mutation, there's nothing I can do about it. So what say you? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, so the APOE4 allele, as you mentioned, very common, increases one's risk for developing um, Alzheimer's disease anywhere between two and 14 fold. But it's not a uh, determinant gene, it's a risk gene. So whether or not somebody develops Alzheimer's disease is ultimately determined by their environment, the dance that their environment plays with that genetic risk factor. You can look to other parts of the world where the APOE4 allele is just as prevalent and um, and popular and, and the APOE4 carrying population has little to no, uh, risk of developing dementia there. Correct. What that suggests is you might be genetically at risk for Alzheimer's disease in the United States and then move to a less industrialized part of the world, like in Ibadan, uh, Nigeria, for example, and see that risk completely abolished. So again, it's not a determinant gene. Um, a very small percentage of patients with Alzheimer's disease carry uh, one type of a determinant gene called um, early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, but that's very rare. That makes up two to 3% of 
Alzheimer's cases. The, the vast majority will develop late onset sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And for that condition, yes, we absolutely do have a say. Um, I think that, uh, and, if, and, and also it's worth mentioning that there are genes that people have that have yet to be discovered that might cancel out the impact of the APOE4 allele. This is called polygenic risk. So, you know, you have a, you have a, a smorgasbord of, of genes baked into every cell in your body. And yes, the APOE4 allele um, exists. It's the most well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene, but it's not the only Alzheimer's risk gene. And there are genes that are, that, that, that substantially modulate the impact that the APOE4 allele has on your health. With regard to the APOE4 allele, I think that one of the, the major issues that it seems to cause is that it puts us at risk for vascular dysfunction. Um, and one, one of the purported mechanisms by which it increases our risk is by putting carriers at risk for um, hyperlipidemia. So like hypercholesterolemia, for example. Um, I actually think that this is a, this is a great insight um, if it holds true, because we know way we have ways of of ensuring that people that carry this gene um, are able are their bodies are better able to manage lipids. Um, dietary fiber, for example, helps to um, improve the liver's ability to recycle LDL cholesterol. We were talking, um, Dr. Gundry, when you were on my podcast recently about how they found that coffee has an ingredient in it. Has a, has a compound in it called caffeine, which actually acts like a natural PCSK9 inhibitor. PCSK9 inhibitors, there's a new class of cholesterol-lowering drug on the market called PCSK9 inhibitors that basically the, the way in which they reduce cholesterol in the blood is not by stopping your liver's synthesis of cholesterol, which is actually, we, we need cholesterol. Cholesterol is a vital life-giving nutrient, right? Found in, in every cell membrane. And that's the way that statins work. Statins block the liver, uh, stop the liver from producing cholesterol. But these, this new class of drugs, I think, is actually um, can be quite helpful in the sense that they improve the, the efficiency and the efficacy of your liver at plucking up these remnant LDL particles from your blood. Right. And how amazing is it that coffee, that green tea, that dark chocolate all have this natural compound in it called caffeine, which acts like a natural PCSK9 inhibitor. Yeah, and as you and I know, there are multiple studies looking at the benefits of drinking like up to five cups of coffee a day in, uh, in brain health and protecting your brain. Um, so, yeah, it's so true. I mean, coffee is a great source of, and it's, it's the primary source, uh, unfortunately, for most Americans of polyphenols, which you talk about all the time. We know that polyphenols support gut health. We know that they act as a, as a prebiotic um, source for the colonic microbiota to ferment and churn out postbiotics, which yep. um, can be very helpful from the standpoint of modulating inflammation in the body. And yes, observationally, we see that people who drink more coffee um, have a have a have a degree of protection against Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, and also cardiovascular disease. So this new study gives us a potential mechanism, right? Um, which I think is which I think is so powerful. Yeah, the the exciting thing, particularly about the microbiome, um, is that really every day we find a, a reason why. Uh, genius foods are having a genius effect uh, and a lot of it is modulated by the microbiome and you know and you go you spend a lot of time in the book you know talking about you know how important that these genius foods are for our gut bacteria to actually uh, benefit directly and make all these other products that are really going to manifest in in better brain health and and in better better mood, better mental health, and I, you know I applaud you for pointing out in the book that this isn't just about your thinking process uh, and how your brain processes information. It's about literally how your brain emotional processes work. Um, you want to spend a little time talking about that was that was that was that a surprise to you i know you came at this to 
prevent uh, you know brain decline. But uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great question. Um, actually, yeah, it, it was a surprise, and it was a major motivating factor to to write my books because I, I started out really passionate about dementia prevention, right? Um, and I, and I realized that dementia begins in the brain often decades before the first symptom. So this was a topic that I felt people of all ages needed to be thinking about their brain health, right? And the choices that they make day to day and how those choices can in, inform the way that their brains work. But I was, I, there was a point at which I felt I was, there was a, a I had reached a, uh, a conundrum because I knew being a younger person, that young people didn't care about dementia, right? So I knew that if I wrote the dementia prevention book, that I wasn't actually going to move the needle on this condition, that I wasn't actually going to further my goal of actually helping people prevent their own dementia, because young, younger people weren't going to buy it if I wrote the dementia prevention book. So I kept researching, I kept researching, and I, and I stayed open minded. And I stumbled upon this burgeoning field of psychiatry being called nutritional psychiatry and nutritional psychiatry. We're just really at the tip of the iceberg, but we are seeing now thanks to a slew of randomized control trials that have come out, the kinds of trials required to prove cause and effect that have used food as an intervention with major mood disorders. I mean, imagine that for decades, you'd go to your psychiatrist and you'd present with a dour mood and they, they write a prescription for a pharmaceutical monotherapy, right? A drug that you would take that would attempt to modulate levels of a certain neurotransmitter in your brain. But now, thanks to places like Deakin University, the Food and Mood Center there, led by um, Felice Jacka, who's a, a wonderful PhD, who's um, spearheading a lot of this work, we see that a dietary pattern akin to the kind of diet that I describe in Genius Foods and in Genius Kitchen can actually significantly reduce symptoms of depression, even in people with major depression, to the point of remission. Whereas the control group that received standard of care didn't have such success. So when I stumbled upon that kind of, of work, I was like, okay, this is my Trojan horse. This is something that everybody wants. Everybody wants a better performing brain. Everybody wants a brain that works as well as it ought to, not, as, not merely as well as we've come to uh, accept, right? But a brain that really lives up to our birthright. And so I started to go down that rabbit, rabbit hole and I realized that the same compounds that are present in these foods that support optimal brain health also support good mental health, whether it's zinc, vitamin B12, preformed omega-3 fatty acids, creatine, which is a, 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 a carnin nutrient found naturally in fish and beef, supports brain energy metabolism. So for people who feel like they don't have enough energy um, throughout the day, it could be due to the fact that they're just not getting enough of this nutrient in, in their food. Um, a wonderful source of dietary protein. You know, our brain thrives when our body moves. And protein is, uh, I know you talk a lot about protein in the context of longevity, but from the standpoint of mobility, of muscle health, um, having high quality protein in your diet is really quite important. Um, and so, and, and also with, in light of all of the research showing just how important exercise is from the standpoint of mental health, right? Like mental uh, exercise is now medicine for the brain. We, we can say that with certainty with regard to our mental health. We can say that with certainty with regard to our predisposition to cognitive decline. Exercise can now significantly help prevent a condition called mild cognitive impairment, which is pre-dementia. Um, it also is as effective as drugs at reducing blood pressure. One of the pivotal studies in the field of dementia prevention, um, a seminal study that was published recently was called the SPRINT MIND trial that found that for people that were um, at risk for developing mild cognitive impairment and who had hypertension, when pharmacologically treated for their hypertension, they saw a significant risk reduction for the development of mild cognitive impairment, which again is pre-dementia. So people who had high blood pressure, we know that high blood pressure is a risk factor for dementia. When treated with a pharmaceutical agent, they slashed their risk for developing cognitive impairment. We now know that exercise is just as effective at, at reducing high blood pressure and without any negative side effects. 
Okay, so so we know we know all this, but you make a really good point in Genius Kitchen that food companies, number one, know this as well, but they don't want you to know this. <laughs> and so what's in it what's in it for them? Why are we so tempted by all these uh, wonderful foods that are killing us? Oh man, well, it's, it's about the bottom line. Food companies love having repeat customers and they know that one of the best ways to earn the loyalty of a, of a consumer is to, is to blow their minds with hyper palatable, ultra processed foods. That's literally what ultra processed foods typically found within the aisles of most major modern supermarkets do. They push your brain to a literal bliss point beyond which self-control becomes futile because these foods light up reward centers in our brain that, um, that really make it difficult, if not impossible to, to stop eating once, once you've, once you've dug into the pint of ice cream, or you've had maybe a handful of those tortilla chips. We tend to think of it as a moral failure when we're unable to moderate our consumption of these foods. But the reality is that these foods are very hard um, to, to, to moderate. And that's because willpower is a finite resource and these foods hijack um, any semblance of willpower that we may have. There was a study that, that was published in 2018 funded by the National Institutes of Health that found that when people eat these kinds of ultra processed foods, so packaged shelf stable foods, frozen dinners, fried foods, um, commercial bread products, that when eating to satiety, in the scientific literature, the term is ad libitum feeding, people end up eating a calorie surplus of about 500 calories. If you eat 500, if you're in a calorie surplus and you eat 500 more calories than your body burns every day for a week, that's a pound of fat gain. That's a pound of fat stored every single week. That adds up to a spare tire really quickly. Conversely, what this, what the researchers in this study found was that when they gave the same subjects access, access to minimally processed foods, the kinds of food that you, the food, the, the type of dishes that you would cook for yourself, for example, they came in at an effortless calorie deficit when eating to the same degree of satiety. They were just as full, they were just as satisfied by their food, but they ended up at a calorie deficit of about 300 calories. So right there, that's an 800 calorie swing, right? 800 calories, that's a lot of calories. That's an 800 calorie swing determined purely by the quality of the food that you're eating. Many people who are overweight, who struggle with their weight, who, who feel that sense of moral failure over and over again because they can't stick to whatever diet it is that they're on and they get told by their doctors, by their nutritionists, just eat less, move more over and over and over again. That sense of, of, of failure uh, that that deficit of willpower, right? That's because they're putting the cart before the horse. They're trying to moderate how much they are consuming of the foods that they were eating that got them into that overweight state in the first place. But the real insight from this study is the quality of the food that you're eating dictates the quantity of the food that you're going to eat. And so that's something that food manufacturers don't want you to know, right? Because because the, 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 the perspective of a food manufacturer is all foods fit. It's not our problem that you're overweight. You just ate too much of what it is that we're putting out uh, of what we're manufacturing. You just ate too much. It's your fault. It's your lack of willpower. All you got to do is eat less and all of your problems will be solved. But their foods are not designed to be moderated. They're designed to create repeat customers. They're designed so that you eat more of them. And so that's why I think those are the food, first foods that people ought to cut out, um, especially when on a weight loss journey, but also for good health. We know that the consumption of ultra processed foods, um, in fact, every uh, every 10 percent increase in ultra processed food consumption is associated with a 14 percent increased risk of early mortality. So these foods are literally killing us. And um, and a little, it's it's. The dose makes the poison to some degree, um, obviously, which which um, which that, that study has shown. But uh, but the 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 best you can do at minimizing your your consumption of those foods 
uh, the better off you'll be. And again, the healthiest people buy a narrow range of good for you foods and they buy those foods on loop. So we, I think most people maybe by now are, are, are figuring out that a lot of these things are not good for us. And yet the addictive quality of these foods makes it really hard to give it up or wean yourself off of it. And you spend a great deal of time in the book uh, giving us uh, hacks of, okay, you know, instead of a highly processed grain product for munching on, uh, take us through a few steps to, to wean ourselves off of this stuff we love. You, you bring up macaroni and cheese, for instance, that, you know, the ultimate comfort food. And you've got a great recipe for macaroni and cheese that uses carrot noodles in, in, in the new book. So, yeah, help, help us out here because you and I are all obviously on the same page here. Yeah, that's what actually one of my favorite recipes. It's, it's funny that you brought it up. It's a it's a vegan. So I, my book, my cookbook is not a vegan cookbook, but it's a this dish is a vegan. So it's it's a dairy free mac and cheese using carrot noodles. So it's gluten free, dairy free. It is so indulgent and tasty. And I think that's one of the great things about knowing how to cook, about culinary literacy. And unfortunately, culinary literacy has been outsourced, right? We've, we've outsourced so many, so many aspects of what it means to be a self-sufficient human these days because we live in the era of specialization, right? We outsource our health literacy. We outsource financial literacy. And culinary literacy, we outsource too when we go to restaurants and when we, when, and when we order up food on our food apps. It's become so easy to order a meal um, comprised of comfort food and have it show up on our doorsteps moments later. But by learning how to cook, and this doesn't have to be difficult, you can make some of your favorite comfort foods and have them actually provide an additive benefit to your health as opposed to taking away your health, right? Like you can actually make fries super healthy because potatoes are actually a fairly nutrient dense food, right? Purple potatoes are a staple in Okinawa, which is one of the world's blue zones. I know you, you, you talk about blue zones all the time, right? You can make, uh, fries with purple sweet potatoes and, and, and bake them and they come out delicious. You can use extra virgin olive oil. If you want to add a little bit of fat to it, really, really increase the, the indulgence factor. But my vegan carrot noodle mac and cheese is so tasty. And really, I mean, that's a recipe like many others that I include in Genius Kitchen to show people that you can have foods that are indulgent, that taste delicious, but that aren't going to hijack your brain's reward centers and be so easy to overconsume that you end up putting on uh, unintentional weight as a result. That's not what this is about. Genius foods, genius meals, to me, are foods that, that satiate your body in a way that processed junk just can't. Rich in, in, in components like fiber, which we know mechanically stretches out the stomach, makes you feel really full. Protein, which is the most satiating macronutrient. Fat, which helps slow digestion of food, right? So anytime you add fat to a, to a dish, you're slowing digestion, you're maintaining that that um that feeling of satiety you know if you fill yourself up on low fat foods you might feel full um in the moment but you're going to feel really hungry pretty soon after and that's because low fat foods digest so rapidly fat slows down what's called gastric emptying so whenever you add fat to something it um it slows down the rate of absorption and it makes you stay full longer um it's one of the reasons why i add now heavy cream to my coffee. I used to drink my coffee black. Sometimes I still do enjoy black. Um, but when I add heavy cream to it um, on, a, on an empty stomach, it slows the infusion of caffeine. It makes me feel a lot better. It makes me feel a lot less jittery than when I just drink it black, which for many years I was doing. So knowing how food affects your hunger, your behavior, I think it's all part of the process of learning how to better nourish and satiate your body. Um, and minimize your risk for unintentional, unintentional weight gain um, today, but chronic disease in the future as well. A point you mentioned early on that I want to come back to, um, we now know that you know, signs of brain damage, Alzheimer's, uh, are, are occurring 20, maybe 30 years before the actual outward signs uh, appear. 
And I think that's, it's really important for realizing, okay, you know, I'm in my 30s or I just turned 40, eh, I don't really have to worry about it because I don't really care what's going to happen, you know, when I'm retired and I can sit in my easy chair. But these are, these are steps that every one of us, regardless of our age, uh, needs to take. You know, when I was a, a pediatric heart surgeon, uh, I could actually see in the uh, blood vessels of, of children and teenagers that I operated on already plaques uh, on the inside of their blood vessels. Um, the Vietnam War, where a lot of our guys came, came home in body bags, uh, these guys in you know late teenage year, years, early 20s, had plaques in their aorta, in their coronary arteries, and you know as as young people. So you're right; it's it's never too early to start making these changes. No, I mean, unfortunately, we're seeing hypertension increase in prevalence in children and adolescents. We know that hypertension damages the blood vessels that go up to your that feed your brain blood, oxygen, antioxidants, building block nutrients. Today, at least one in seven adults has a memory complaint, has some form of subjective cognitive impairment. One in six adults is on some kind of psychiatric drug. Generally, that number shoots up to one in four for women over the age of 40, which is heartbreaking to say the least. I mean, before my mom had a diagnosis of, of dementia, her, one of her physicians, a psychiatrist, actually thought that all of her symptoms were due to depression, which is really quite sad when you think about it. The, the willingness to just chalk up the symptoms that we're having to, to depression, right? Especially in, in, in women. Now, there are some kinds of dementia that symptoms that may look like dementia when somebody is clinically depressed. It's called a pseudo dementia. But, um, but yeah, people are not generally happy with the, with the way that their brains are working and rates of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are increasing. And as you mentioned, they begin in the brain far earlier than the presentation of symptoms. And this isn't just a question of diet. It's a question of our lifestyles. We are more sedentary than we've ever been before. We also live in environments that are increasingly polluted. There are a number of studies that are coming out um, from very polluted parts of the world that are showing us that air pollution um, with, uh, in, in particular, um, fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, actually can pierce the blood-brain barrier and can um, instigate pathology that's really similar to Alzheimer's disease pathology, but decades before Alzheimer's disease would typically emerge um, in the brain. So there are all these different factors, but I think food is something, it's such a, it's such a potent leverage point because we all eat at least three times a day. We know you eat once a day, Dr. Gundry, but, <laughs> um, but most of us eat two, three times a day and snack in between. So with every bite you take, that's a choice that you make for your, for, for your cognitive destiny. And, um, and again, it's, it's that leverage point. And one of the reasons why I wrote Genius Kitchen is because beyond um, conversations about protein, fat, fiber, one of the most powerful leverage points that a person has is just cooking at home more, learning how to cook at home more. When you can make the same dish at home that you would get out at a restaurant and it's going to have fewer fat calories, fewer calories overall, less sodium, and and also improve the dynamics of your family while you're at it. Cooking at home with family members, loved ones, it's one of the best ways to bolster relationships, to bond, to communicate, to express love. And these all play a role in living a genius life in, in helping to kick de the can down the road with regard to uh, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, right? Social connection plays such a huge role. And there's no better way to, um, to, to show love to somebody than by cooking and sharing a meal with them. So, uh, and actually, one of the unique features of the Blue Zones is this uh, family food connection. Um, and, and so met, so much of the Mediterranean diet, you know, the a meal uh, may last uh, two hours, um, you know, at the, at least. Not some grab fast, you know, let's wolf this down and go on to the next activity. But you you, you spend a lot of time in the book, and a congratulations on 
how do you learn to cook? I mean, it is really a lost art. I mean, wh where do you start? Uh, you, you, you break down the genius pantry. Come on, how do, how do we start? G give, us some, give us some hints. I, I know nothing about a kitchen. That's not true, <laughs> folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. It can be intimidating to the uninitiated, but I think you have, to, you have to draw inspiration from parts of the world like the Mediterranean region, where they prioritize quality of ingredients over quantity of ingredients. So by stocking your kitchen with just a small handful of essentials, you can do so much. Having a, a good extra virgin olive oil, some really high quality salt. Now, if you're like me, you have three different kinds of salt in your kitchen. You've got your fine salt, you've got your coarse salt, and you've got your flake salt. I actually recommend having all three types of salt because salt generally is very inexpensive, but it's one of the best ways to elevate your cooking to restaurant quality. I love cooking, for example, a steak or a piece of fish or uh, even um, roast up some vegetables and finishing whatever it is that I'm making with some flake salt. They do this in, re in high-end steakhouses. And it's a very inexpensive way to really elevate the quality of your cooking and the, the experience uh, of eating um, with, a, with a high quality salt. Pepper, garlic powder. I mean, these are just the bare essentials and you can do so much. I mean, you can make vegetables delicious with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, garlic, salt, pepper. Um, I think that one of the 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 biggest areas where people mess up with regard to home cooking is that they just don't season their food well if you ask any professional chef what home chefs uh do wrong they don't they undersalt their food salt is crucially important it lights up reward centers in our brain because salt for the vast majority of our evolution was actually a, a new provided a nutrient that was very hard to come by right yep. sodium sodium is actually a macro mineral which means that for good health you need to consume a relatively large amount of it every day. And once you cut out the ultra processed packaged foods, the question then becomes, well, where are you getting your sodium from? Because Dr. Gundry, it's only 11% of the sodium that Americans ingest every day that come from their own salt shakers and from the salt that they add to their own recipes. The vast majority of sodium that your average American ingests comes from ultra processed foods, shelf stable, canned foods, fast food, and restaurant food. That's it. That's where that, that's where that, all of that sodium comes from. But once you cut those foods out to feel good, you need to, you need to bring salt back to the table. I find it very ironic that most registered dietitians will say if, if, if they, uh, for whatever reason are advising you to cut down on your sodium intake, they'll say, stop adding salt to your food. When <laughs> the irony is that the number one source of sodium in the American diet, it isn't processed meat, it isn't canned foods, it's bread and rolls. But when was the last time you heard a registered dietitian tell you to avoid bread and rolls? No, they tell you to stop salting your food, making your life miserable, the life of your kids miserable probably, if you have them, because some of the healthiest foods in the supermarket, produce, right, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, simply aren't palatable without adding a little bit of salt. So knowing how to salt your food, to me, that's, I mean, that is like, that's the base of the culinary food pyramid, knowing how to season your food well. Well, I'm gonna keep pressing you. Where, where do you start? I mean, do you start cooking some eggs and working on the seasonings? You've got some cool egg recipes with broccoli in your book. Um, I mean, just, how do I how do I start? I, I want my bowl of cereal every morning, Max. Uh, I have <laughs> to I have to have my bowl of cereal, which probably has uh, folks. I did this for a patient a couple weeks ago. His bowl of rice checks had 14 teaspoons of sugar that was hidden uh, on the label, and he thought he was eating a low sugar food, and he was shocked. Uh, it, so yeah, how do we start? How do you start? Well, I think that one, one useful tip is that you should taste your food as you go, provided that it's, that it's safe to do so. But there are no points to be won for not tasting until you finish the dish. Sometimes people feel that it's, <laughs> that, uh, it's more indicative of a skilled chef to not have to taste their food. But tasting as you go is a really great way to see how textures and flavors develop over time. 
over the course of the cooking process. And cooking low and slow is something that is also really important. Getting, getting, uh, um, acquainted with um, lower cooking temperatures um, and and spending more time in the cooking process. Getting rid of the cereal, for example, and and bringing eggs back to the breakfast table is crucially important. Eggs, I actually have coined the term cognitive multivitamin to describe eggs. Egg yolks contain literally everything that nature, a little bit of everything that nature has deemed important to grow and sustain a healthy brain. It's no wonder that egg yolks are rich in cholesterol because the brain is rich in cholesterol. You don't need to eat cholesterol to support brain health, but typically where you find dietary cholesterol, you find nutrients that, that are good for the brain. And the egg is the perfect illustration of that. It's got a little bit of vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids, and to cook a scramble um, well, most people they make scrambles. P admittedly, people tend to make breakfast when they're in a rush, but the best scramble is going to come when you put the heat on as low a setting as possible and you constantly stir it low and slow. A good scramble should take 10 minutes to cook. You're going to end up with e eggs so good. You've, I mean, you've never had them as good as, as you will. If you, if you try cooking them low and slow, as opposed to overcooking, which most people do when they make a scramble. The danger with overcooking eggs, it's not just a, a culinary concern. You're potentially damaging the delicate fats and the cholesterol content of those eggs. You're, you're, you're causing oxidation of the delicate fats and the cholesterol that egg yolks contain. For me, I love to make a scramble um, on very low heat, constantly stirring, and, um, and doing that until just before the eggs get to a consistency that I like because the eggs will continue to firm up after you take them off the heat. So you want to stir them until just before your desired consistency, you take it off the heat and you plate the eggs and they'll continue to firm up. They'll continue to cook. So that's, that's crucially important. The same way that you take a steak off the grill just before it gets to your desired temperature, because it continues to the, in, the core, it continues to heat up. Um, so too with eggs, you want to uh, take them off the heat just before. And they come out delicious, Dr. Gundry. And then you finish them with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, which we know is medicine for the brain. You throw on a little bit of um, flake salt, maybe nutritional yeast, which is a rich source of B vitamins, uh, a, a food staple that I happen to love. And you've got yourself a killer dish that would rival the, uh, any, any restaurant's egg dish. I love your description of slow, you know, slow cooking in regards to a chicken leg. Um, uh, you make the point that one of the benefits of l slow cooking is breaking down a basically inedible substance, collagen and all these tendons in like a chicken leg and you vividly describe biting into a kind of not well cooked chicken leg and you go, oh, yeah, this doesn't taste good. But at the same time, if you spend some time slow cooking that chicken leg, like most traditional cultures have learned, you, you break down all that collagen into a succulent, easily absorbable uh, food. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is another area where most people screw up in the kitchen. They cook these kinds of, of, of parts of the animal too fast, not allowing the collagen that they contain to break down and form gelatin, which is that, that super delicious butter soft uh, component that occurs when you cook collagen low and slow. Joints like the chicken drumstick, chicken thigh, have four times the the collagen content of chicken uh, of of chicken breast meat, for example, white meat. Yeah, and anybody who's ever bitten, and I get I even in restaurants, like yeah, I, I'm shocked when I when I bite into a a chicken leg in a, a drumstick in a restaurant and it's undercooked because you get those you get all those tendons that are just gross. I'm sorry, but like if you're not cooking a chicken leg low and slow. Um, you can, a chicken leg cooked low and slow, the meat is fall off the bone. There's not, there's almost not a single component to the chicken leg that isn't delicious, right? When you cook it low and slow. And I think that's, I mean, that it, it's, it's so 
crucially important. And I'll add that for people that are on low income, um, that have tight budgets with, with regard to cooking, cooking your meats low and slow is another, is a fantastic way to economize because you can buy whole chickens and by cooking low and slow, you turn those parts of the chicken, drumsticks, chicken thighs, what have you, um, into amazing, uh, foods. And it's also a way to buy, to economize with regard to um, red meat because you can buy cheaper cuts. If you can't afford the most pristine beef tenderloin, grass-fed ribeyes that, that, that you'd like to, well, guess what? You can buy cheaper cuts and all you got to do is cook them low and slow and it becomes this pull apart, fall off the bone. I mean, that's how brisket is made, right? Brisket is made by cooking. Be- it's, a, it's typically a very tough meat. Yeah. But the, the beauty of, of well-cooked brisket, it's been cooked low and slow. All the collagen melts down. It breaks apart the proteins and it becomes butter soft. I've got a number of recipes um, that actually use those cheaper cuts of meat in, in my book, Genius Kitchen. It's, it's so important. Ribs, for example. Um, I don't know, Dr. Gundry, where you stand on, on ribs, but I happen to love a good rack of organic baby back, baby back ribs, ribs, and (laughs) you can make the most amazing ribs in your, in your home, in your oven. You don't need to go to a fancy barbecue restaurant and overpay for them. You can, you can make them. All it takes is a little bit of time. In Genius Kitchen, I have the best rib rub, dry rib rub you've ever had in your life. No added sugar, no, you know, calorie dense sauce required. You just use this rub, you throw them on a rack of ribs, you put them in your oven, low and slow for three and a half, four or five hours. I mean, the longer, the better. And it breaks down again, the collagen, the connective tissue, and it makes the ribs fall off the bone. It's just, it's so great. And knowing how to cook like that, um, it's just, uh, it's so empowering. And um, it's such a crowd pleaser as well, because again, these are foods as, as you, you know, with regard to one of your questions earlier, Dr. Gundry, these are foods that we typically think of as, as being junk foods, right? Like going to a, a barbecue restaurant and, and indulging, but you can actually make all these same foods with just a few minor tweaks and make them actually quite healthy and just as delicious, if not more so. Yeah. The, um, it, it's interesting that, you know, traditional cultures, cultures that are doing, you know, doing very well from a brain health standpoint, they've been experts at long, slow cooking for generations because they're poor and they have to get something, you know, out of these horrible, you know, cuts of, of whatever animal they're eating. And it's, you know, the slow cooking process that's so important. The other thing, I, I'm going to have to let you go, but I think I'm, I'm going to tell you, audience, particularly ladies listening or watching, you're, you're obsessed with collagen. You've got your collagen smoothies, your collagen drinks, your collagen bars. And what you hear, heard here is your boneless, skinless chicken breast is a horrible source of collagen compared to a thigh or a leg. Uh, you know, four times as much, right? Four so, times as much. Yeah. So and so, get get the dark meat. Get rid of the white chicken breast, which uh, really is not nature's energy powerhouse for your brain, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. So that's a great take home message. And thanks, you know, thanks for sharing that. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast. Make sure to check out the next one here. Two thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women, which means that for every man suffering from Alzheimer's, there are two women. And that is something we just don't talk about.